We're now in the midst of what's set to be a huge week in the context of the season as Celtic head Tybrooks on Sunday top of the table and looking to maintain our 100% record against Scotland's second best team this season. We'll discuss all of that and much more in this latest episode of the Celtic Exchange Weekly. This is Tino. Tonight I'm joined by a full house of Assam, James and Paddy as we once again cover all things Celtic. Assam, nice to have you back on the show. Nice to have Celtic top of the table. What are you saying at the moment? Yeah, it's... Um Definitely a, a, a very positive weekend, I think, um, just in terms of players coming back. Rio Tati, I think, was was a real bright spot, just to see him back to kind of where he left off. Because uh, I know there's been a concern sometimes with Rio that he might take a few games to get up to speed, but I think right from the off, you could see how much value he brings to the team. And all in all, I was quite encouraged. I know at 0-0 at half-time, um, some people might have been a wee bit concerned, but I thought we were still looking pretty dangerous without actually the end product. Uh, but second half was solid from back to front. So I think we are going into next week in pretty much as good a position as we could hope for in terms of players coming back and just a bit of form as well. So, yeah, all to to look forward to. Yeah, absolutely. Paddy, just in terms of some of the stuff Asim said there about how it played out at Levy, nothing each at half-time. Um, question for you in a second, were you concerned? Was the result ever in doubt? But in terms of some of the stats, first half, 77% possession, but only one shot on goal. Second half, similar possession, 75% but nine shots on goal. It's clear we ramped up half time wise and beyond and from that point on there was only one winner. Yeah, I think we we're, we're always in control of the game, absolutely. Um it's very difficult sometimes and as we touched on on Friday, a slow park um can really like upset our, our play. Um could we look at the full 90 minutes and say that we could go up a couple of gears? I I think so. I, I still think that there is that in us. And that's with a, a team that's coming back and getting a bit stronger and the likes of CCV playing, Hitati coming back and getting an hour um, as well. Absolutely crucial. Um, and then you're hoping for next week, if it's if it's looking likely that you see McGregor coming back and slotting right back in there, I think they level up again. I really do. Yeah, I think there's there's clearly levels to go and hopefully Sunday comes when we, we bring them at the party. James, we were chatting just a wee bit before coming on there um, about... Livingston as a as a club as an entity they're gone more or less they're, they're pretty much down already but what you do have to credit them for is seeing the value in selling out their stadium Celtic as we've seen to great effect yesterday had three sides of the, the ground brilliant banners brilliant display what's the message I've got it here hold on to our title boys don't give up the dream and it was spectacular green white and gold yeah. tricolour across the stadium really good to see but the moment you turn on your telly and I made that point there the atmosphere's just booming out at you and that's on Sky Sports that's going around the you know the UK if anyone wants to tune in and you'd far rather see and hear something like that than some of the nonsense we've been served across the season so far yeah I mean let's not be confused it's not a benevolent gesture you know it's because it it puts money in the till and that's what a small provincial club needs and it, it's good that they're not so bloody minded to say well we'll try and have the majority fans and like you know Hibs Hearts and Kamarnock and all that kind of stuff I mean, talk about shooting yourself in the foot, but when they do that, those clubs, they just kill the atmosphere in terms of selling this game to others and, and you know, bigging up, we're talking about generally, you know, bigging up the game and how poor the media coverage is and, and everything like that. And Livy don't fall for that. They do, you know, create the atmosphere. The football is poor, has been, you know, since they came into the Premiership and the pitch is a disgrace. So for those reasons, I'm happy to see them go. But yeah, for the atmosphere, yeah, fair play to them. Yeah, I'll stay with you for now, James. Uh, I was accusing you last week of throwing on the tin. Well, for well, well. <laughs> can't, well, can't, well. Can't remember what madness you came out with last week, but I'm going to come back to you this week for <laughs> your learned opinion on the penalty that wasn't. Uh, Kyogo Furuhashi, just before half time, is it Devlin, the defender? Yeah. Yep. Kicks through the back of Kyogo. In football, in days past, that's not a penalty. In the modern day, when the Thanks threshold so. is so low to get a penalty, Ergo Rangers penalty on Saturday at Ibrox. It's a penalty all day long and you're just waiting for the ball to go out so they can do the VAR check, we can go through the formalities and watch Don Robertson do that and he didn't do that. I don't think that's a, a modern development as a, as a penalty other than it gets a second look by VAR. I mean, you look at, need to look at it in the round. There was a penalty that wasn't a penalty at Ibrox that they got on Saturday and a penalty that was a penalty that we didn't get at Livy. So what I said last week was the referees would up their game and there you go. That That's one fixture calendar they've run through so I'm going to stick to my guns on that one and you've seen nothing yet which is your happens on Sunday <laughs> but in terms of that penalty what it is it's two guys going for the ball and it's as I was saying to ask him there before um, it's about 45 in Devon's favour and 55 Kyogo in terms of where the ball's coming towards Kyogo's fast and he gets in front and he makes it you know 90-10 but Devon doesn't stop 
is his problem and he kicks right through the back of Kyogo and it's a penalty before VAR you know, 10 years ago 20 years ago kick a guy in the box you don't get the ball it's a penalty why that then went to VAR Alan Muir you remember him yep. and he 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 does the quickest VAR check Aye. doesn't send Robertson to the, the monitor I think if Robertson goes to the monitor and sees all angles he's, he's given that all day he's not going to the monitor and bear in mind that, that was the same area where McCausland got that ridiculous penalty yeah. earlier in the season where he got zero contact and he just folded his legs and got a penalty so you know I mean I watched Alan Morrison's um, interview with uh, Paul John on Axum earlier on so I'm fired up for it all <laughs> <laughs> they've got they've got me full of stats it's on my to-do list is it worth a watch very much so yeah, yeah so I'm yeah. going to check that out it's doing the rounds just now and Alan, Alan's excellent but he's Alan's not <laughs> He's not like James. He's not a moon howler. He's not. A, he's not yeah, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I think we've gone quite well. But Alan presents with info and stats. He just backs it. He's not here saying there's a, demo, uh, a democracy. That's the wrong word. There's a <laughs> conspiracy. 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 <laughs> the, almost the opposite. But he's just backing up with examples and facts and stats from what I'm, I'm led to believe. So I look forward to watching that, Paddy. But what's your take on it? Do you know, just one thing before I do get your reply. Mm -hmm. I think Alan Muir is making a mockery of, of the on-pitch referee. He's making Don Robertson look stupid because he's the one that, oh, Rob, how did Robertson not give that? Robertson may well have given that had he been allowed to go to the screen. I, sorry, buddy. I didn't think it was a penalty in real time. It was only yeah. when I saw the replays I went, oh, it's clearly a penalty. Th yes, they're not working well together. The only thing that I, I keep kind of like looking at it in terms of like where, where, if anywhere, have they seen that like they don't think that's a penalty? And the only thing I keep thinking back to is Kamar Roof and Lager Bielke at the beginning at the game at Ibrox like the in possession exactly yeah. and that that's where my thinking is is that they're looking at the stills they're looking at the movement and they're thinking that Mikey Devlin's in possession of that ball he's nowhere near it they need yeah. to and he's nowhere near it but they need to come out and, and clear up why that is not a penalty where well, they won't because if you look at it in the still you could kind of make the argument that it does look like it's it's Devlin's ball but Kyogo's nipped in in front yeah. and then the contacts came in but the ball's played across the box. Mm -hmm. It makes no sense at all. I, 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 I'm baffled by it. And then, I'm sure we'll touch on it, but you're getting people coming up with stuff that's not even happening on the TV about Kyogo already being down before contact being made is an absolute joke. I, I, just crazy, crazy I, what we're up against. I think, and you know they've been quite good over the years, but behind the whistle of made an arse themselves on this one they've got it totally wrong they've made a ridiculous call do you want to explain that so behind the whistle is the referees podcast yeah. used to be get involved referee and there's been a kind of change behind the scenes there um, I know Des relatively well Des Roach former grade one official and it's him and Stephen Conroy I've just glanced at a tweet today so I don't know the full context of it but I think they've come down completely wrongly from what I can see but could you explain to anyone that's not seen it so far much similar to what Paddy's saying they've, they've gone with stills rather than footage and you know if you show this still in that angle and this and I wouldn't well, actually look photoshopped it's that bad <laughs> um, you, you, you might come to conclusions but just right, you can use the stills to inform you towards the footage and then watch the footage but it's the footage that will tell you and the two angles one behind Kyogo and one facing Kyogo and it's just stonewaller stuff but they've stuck to their guns and like see if you've got new evidence it's okay to change your mind you know but what are, are they saying something like Kyogo actually stands on Devlin is that not what he stands on his toe and stuff like this <sighs> and he's, he's already he's jumped in front of Devlin's they're making out Devlin's about to receive the ball which he's not and Kyogo's jumped in front of him and taking the kick as if uh, Roof jumping in front of Ligger Bielka when he's in possession of the ball two completely different things I'll give Des a shout after. We'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll I'd see love Des's about. right reply, and that's you know that's uh, we genuinely want to see that, particularly from someone who's informed and has been in the game in that regard. Yeah, let's move on from it for now. Before we end up down a, a real wormhole <laughs> uh, with all of that, um, as I want to touch on a fella you mentioned and rightfully so, Real Hitati. first appearance for Celtic since he had twenty minutes off the bench against St Mirren on the second of January. Before that, he only had seven minutes against Atletico on twenty fifth of October before he broke down that night. He's played very little football this season. That was his 12th appearance of the season and he's only played 591 minutes. But it was great to see him back. What a boost for Celtic. Yeah, uh, you, you know, he's one of he's one of the only ones in our midfield, I think, that has the ability to really speed up our game, the game of our play, uh, speed up the play of our game. Um, he, he gets the ball in the half turn and he, he automatically moves it forward at speed. And I just think that's something that was so noticeable very early on um, in comparison to some of our other midfielders. Um, who all I thought played pretty well but I just think he offers that something different um, and I was a bit worried about him coming into the plastic pitch you know after that long out and he's not had a lot of minutes and I've said before that he does sometimes take a bit longer to get up to speed but I thought he 
he took the game by the scruff of the night very early on um, and it just adds a bit of fluidity to our team so him getting those 60 minutes playing as well as he did and then you've got the poss- possibility of Callum McGregor coming back in next week you've suddenly got good options in there um, and the, the trio that I would go with would be like Hattati, McGregor and O'Reilly and I think the three of them work really well so let's hope McGregor is fit but I just think having Rio gives the fans a boost and I think the teammates as well you see that, mm. the players around them they must like you, you, you must enjoy playing with a player like that you know, he's, he's just so dynamic um, had a good couple of shots on goal as well so he can, he can chip in with goals um, and I think it really highlights how much we have missed him at times you, you, you know, when we've missed like Sakata Vickers and Hattati, you can see why it's had such an impact on our team when you see yesterday, even just Carter Vickers, how good he is at the back and how assured we look. So I think having these guys back for the run-in could really be crucial. 100%. Paddy, I think Paolo Bernardo's a good footballer. I think Tomoki Awata's a good footballer. But none of the two of them are real Hattati. He's a different level of footballer altogether. He is. Um, I, I think um, I'd said this on Friday as well. I think um, he... he for me, he's he's better than Matt O'Reilly and what he, he offers up. It's just for it's everything that he sees. His vision is entirely different from what we get from any of our other attacking midfielders. Um, he could be better than Callum McGregor. I do think that. I do think that um, if he stays fit, if he stays fit, I just think he's such an intelligent footballer, reads the game so so well, and has just his vision has. Pa- short passing, long passing is just uh, uh, he's got everything, but it's just that staying fit yeah. that seems to be the, the, the big issue and, and maybe a reason why he's not um, done much in his career, albeit I, I, I know his, his journey via via university and the likes. But I still think that um, he, he's got levels to to go and and sixty minutes the other uh, yesterday and, and you know looked as if he was he was fairly comfortable with it as well. So. They, they've not rushed them back for a reason. I think they've got them up to a really good level of fitness and it's now just match practice. Um, but confident for them. Yeah. You and I done the, the pre-match on Friday, Paddy, and I said at the time and I reiterated it here, James, I think Rio Hattati, he's certainly Celtic's most creative um, outlet and I think he's potentially the best player at the club. I think he's such a talent and it's easy when you're having an up and down season like Celtic are having. You know, it's been it's been a roller coaster at different times. And it's sometimes easy and lazy to say, ah, but Hattati's missing, what a difference he could make. But you can see that with a lot of players. I think it's a real genuine point. We really miss him. We really miss what he brings to the table in terms of goals and assists. Don't know if you've seen his post-match interview. His English is getting there. He's kind of still doing it through an interpreter. He's claiming the goal. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm giving him it, Paddy. I'm I'm happy with that. What do you think, James? What was the question? Uh, (laughs) Are you you giving him the goal? (laughs) no, I'm not giving him the goal. I'm giving him an outstanding performance. I didn't expect to see him um, b- just because of the pitch. It's totally changed the way that you uh, approach the game on Sunday, the yeah. build-up to the game, because I thought he'd maybe get not even half an hour, you know, a 10, 20 minutes just to be extra cautious. But Rodgers is taking your view that he's my best player and I want to see if he's ready. Um, so he's played that 60 minutes and he's He's more than in contention. I think he starts. I think that's a, a given now, right? Yeah. So you're starting to look at your midfield now, and I know we'll, we'll come on in more detail, and you start looking at the midfield and going, well, right, there's one of the three gone. Um, McGregor, if he's available, mm-hmm. he's in. Is he? 100%. If, if he's available. If he's, available, if he's fit, sorry. yeah, because he's, he's got the experience of that tight. He doesn't need time to get up to speed. February so 22. Like, that's yeah, all I think about. Banging right back yeah. in, didn't he? Mm-hmm. So he's, he's in. So you're really looking at, is McGregor going to be in the six with O'Reilly? in front of him and Hattati or is Awata going to keep his place with McGregor and Hattati in front of him and for me I thought Awata was outstanding on, on, on Sunday now you can argue the quality of opposition all that kind of stuff but I just think he settled into that six role really well and it, it's natural for him it's a real debate over what you get and what you lose by bringing McGregor back or having him forward and mm. what you get and what you lose by leaving the rally out all together who's off form to be fair but the form for me would be Iwata, McGregor and Hatati. That's not necessarily how it's going to go. Before um, Callum McGregor got injured, they were doing the whole Iwata mm-hmm. sitting deep and, and pushing McGregor further up. We only got to do it for a couple of games Twice. before the injury. I tell you, we'll do it. I do have some questions regarding Sunday's midfield right. lineup later in the piece, so we'll, we'll put a bit of focus on that then. Um, Paddy, last question, just as we're covering a wee bit on Rio Hatati. What a plus certainly to see him get. I think it was actually 65 minutes, so huge bonus for that. But also, out with... Out with a 3 0 win, back to the top of the table, clean sheet and all that stuff. It's Cameron Cattle Vickers coming through the 90 minutes. It's yeah. brilliant to see that and it's so important to Celtic. It's massive. I think um, we're, we're, we're 
very quick to kind of look at how up and down our season has been in terms of points dropped over the over the course and um, definite questions about some of the performances. Definite, like w- without uh, without a doubt, we've had some poor performances this season. But what we've not had is a fully fit squad, and we've spoke about this quite a lot lately. Um, perfect time for it to come back together. I'm just uh, I'm excited for the run in. Um, these guys have been massive for us for the last two seasons. Uh, Carter Vickers, Satati, and and obviously Callum McGregor. I just think that they know what it takes. Um, real confidence for the rest of the team as well that you you had mentioned. Um, I just think it's going to be an exciting run in for us. But I, I tell you what, a a, a good good kind of kick off to the run in yesterday um, yesterday for us, and just continuing a, a bit of good form just now. But as I say. Um, the more these guys play together, I, I just think that they'll kick into another level. I really do. Yeah, and I think there's no better time than to get your squad together after some some really challenging injuries to various key players. I think at the moment, Louis Palmer is the only injury concern, mm-hmm. which is, and the suggestion is he'll be back for the weekend, which is a great position to be in. And you've got all your your big hitters, Hatai, Callum McGregor and Carter Vickers, potentially three, three of Celtic's, you know, top players, the most important players, have all missed crucial parts at different times. Asma, I want to look at the moment on another guy who had a key role to play yesterday, but it was off the park, it was John Kennedy. Obviously he steps in. Paddy and I covered the the ban, so Brendan Rodgers missed the game against Levy, back for Ibrox, and that's a huge boost. John Kennedy, the kind of long-standing number two at Celtic, he steps in in his absence. And I'm going to read a quote out first of all. So he was asked a question by Luke Shanley on Sky Sports, quite a negative question, I think regarding Celtic's recent clean sheet record. John Kennedy replies, It's always nice when you focus on the negatives. We've scored 17 goals outside of the Hearts game and we've scored another three today. Our defensive game is always important. We know that always gives us momentum as well. Today we were strong. We were really strong at the back. I don't even know if Levy got a corner. They didn't. All round, it was very pleasing. What do you think about John Kennedy and how important he is to Brendan Rodgers' setup? Yeah, he's he's been there so long now, isn't he? That the, he's obviously offering something that so many different managers have trusted him and have kept him and, and wanted him to stay as part of the picture. And you know, I, I know a few boys, like one of my one of my friends who kind of works at Celtic as well, and he says behind the scenes he's he's brilliant with the players. He you know the players trust him, they get on with him. So by all accounts, he he's he's a steady kind of guy to have around. And anytime I've heard him in interviews in in the manager's absence, I think he comes across really well. And, I think, as you say, he dealt with that really well because it was it was after a very good performance and result, um, a quite loaded negative question, and and he's dealt with it brilliantly because I did think yesterday it was you know it was one of those games where I didn't ever feel like Levy were going to score, um, and we just looked so assured. So yep, Kennedy, um, as expected, I think we you know fans of maybe on the back of the COVID season, were kind of wanting them out and just wanted everyone out from whoever was related to that season. But I think you've seen under Ange. And now again under Rodgers, these managers trust them for a reason. They want them around for a reason. Um, and I think that shows through more and more every time you hear them. So, uh, yeah, I think he's he's doing well. And, you know, he's, he's obviously one that the, the manager's happy to kind of take on the ownership when and when he's not there. Someone messaged us recently saying that Kennedy and anyone else involved during that failed 10 season should have been out. And I says, well, what about all the other seasons where we've won the league with John Kennedy? I think John Kennedy must have something like nine or 10 of the last 11 titles, something so, like that. So, listen, glass half full, glass half empty, depends how you want to look at it. You could certainly just say, one bad season, he's out. Right. What about nine good seasons? I think he's played a huge part. James, just in terms of the bigger picture, not specifically about John Kennedy, but how important do you feel it is that a manager in general is able to be on the sidelines? There was a debate whether it really mattered if Rodgers missed or not and whether he was going to miss Ibrox or not. But how important do you feel that the manager you know, can be there and really kind of feeling the pulse of the game, you know, pick, picking up on things that you just won't pick up in the stands um, and guiding these players through. Do you think it's vital or is it not so much a big thing in this modern game? I think it's, it's less important. It's still important, but it's less important when you've got a guy sitting next to you who's calmed up to Kennedy and can really message you. So it's it's almost like he's talking to Kennedy directly. But um, I think one of the big things is how tight your team is. So Rogers and Kennedy know each other very, very well, go back many, many years. So... He knows exactly what he wants Kennedy to do and Kennedy knows how to do it. So there's, there's there's less issue there. If it's a start of the season, if it's a new combination of manager, assistant manager, that kind of thing, maybe it's it's, it's more acute. But it, it certainly didn't impact us yesterday. Would you want it for Sunday? No. So, you know, it's, it maybe just depends on the game. Paddy, do you think it's a, a huge and welcome boost that Rodgers will be back on the track for it's, Sunday? You want your manager there every, every week, do you know? Um, it's, it's a psychological boost, absolutely. I think there's been people kicking and screaming about it. So, 
that's a that's a start straight away. Um, that's a that's a small win for Celtic. Um, he's massive in these fixtures. Um, incredible record. He's got one one defeat in them, and I always just think back to that three two game. Uh, to the goal to go and say, do you know what? We're down to ten men. I'm putting a striker on. That's what that's what this manager's all about. We we uh, we some of our fans I think can be quick to forget that. I think he. He knows the magnitude of the fixture and I think he reads the games very well. Um, and we've seen that with a victory at Ibrox at the beginning of this season and then a comfortable victory in in, uh, in December as well. So, yeah, he, he should be there and it's great to have him there. I think particularly for this fixture though, it's, it's a fixture he, yeah. he, he really, really shines in. Mm-hmm. And especially with us having no fans there, I just think having his presence there will make such a difference. Yeah, I think it's huge. There's a stat doing the rounds today, I think it was in our group chat, James, don't know if it's true or not, I need to check it, but Brendan Rodgers record that Ibrooks 83% win rate, Philip uh, Lamonks 81%. So the, <laughs> the stats are there if you want to check them out. Listen, it's a huge weekend ahead for Celtic, and remember, we'll be back on Friday with an extended pre-match special. Myself, James and Paddy are doing that at 12 noon on Friday, and we'll be back on Sunday shortly after the game with the final whistle show. If you aren't already following or subscribing to the Celtic Exchange on YouTube, Apple, Spotify or wherever you get your podcast, then do so now to ensure you don't miss a single thing this week. Let's take a short break and when we come back we'll take a look at one player in particular who stood up to be counted on a number of occasions this season. Welcome back folks. Celtic's Player of the Year event is taking place at the Hydro this year on Sunday 12th of May and as part of that, voting is now open for the Fans Player of the Year. The shortlist includes Kyogo, Matt O'Reilly, Liam Scales, Callum McGregor, Dyson Maeda, Alistair Johnson, it's a long shortlist isn't it? Greg Taylor. <laughs> and there's one remaining name which I've not yet read out but one who has really stepped up for me and he'll definitely be getting my vote James and it's Joe Hart. I think it's unusual in a season where touch wood and all that stuff, hopefully you're going to claim the title, potentially the Scottish Cup as well. And it's not one of your creatives, one of your forward type players. But I think Joe Hart has really, really stepped up, particularly performance wise, yes, you know, in the last few weeks and months, but just as a leader. We've missed Callum McGregor, we've missed Cameron Carter Vickers, and you need the presence of someone who's been there and done that. And I think Joe Hart's taken a lot of boxes for Celtic right now. Yeah, and he has done since he came in the door. You know, he's been such a massive signing for us. And, you know, a lot of folk didn't expect him to be the massive character and contributor that he has been in these last, you know, nearly three seasons. Um, you see the way he conducts himself with interviews, pre and post match, whatever, whether he's a captain or not. He's just so assured, so calm, um, so positive and resolute. And you know he's carrying that message everywhere he goes, in the dressing room, at training, on the pitch. And the players feed off that, particularly, as you, as you say, times when we've been not just missing captains, but, you know, not just missing important players, but missing your captain as well, he said, he said to fill in there. So, where did we get my vote? I, so, there's a, a friend of ours that follows the show, Brian, and he's he's went to give, he has given Hart man of the match on a few occasions this season. I, I tend to not do that because it sends out the wrong message, which is wrong, right? I understand that. The message is what the message is. <laughs> is he the best player on the day? Um, so, so, I don't tend to do, because it, like you say, it says that you've been under the caution and stuff, but he has... In particular this season, because I think towards the start of the season, he was coming under a bit of pressure. You know, maybe the odd, you know, um, say they hadn't, you know, you hadn't quite got to or something like that. And it was like, oh, see, I told you. And there's just too much of that told you so stuff in football in general, I think, or maybe society in general. But they were just on him, saying, you know, we should replace him. And don't get me wrong, we should have replaced him. We tried to be serious, we got that wrong and we should have fixed that in the summer. And we didn't. Now we absolutely need to because Joe's going to retire. But he then picked up his form about you know, October, November, whatever it was, and he's been key for us ever since then. Big, big saves and big, big games getting us over the line. And he, he deserves all the plaudits that's coming to him. Paddy, you've got that situation at Celtic, fairly unique, that as a goalkeeper, you can do nothing for 85 minutes and then have to spring into life. I should have had the exact examples for this section, but was it St. Johnson? We were, were yeah. we a yeah. goal up or two up and he's... I think we're two one up, two one. We scored, and he yeah. and he saved one, a real great save at Celtic Park and at the Rangers end, if you want to call it that. And we break up the park, and it's three one, and it's job's done. But that's just one example. I think he stepped up time after time, and he was under huge pressure. He is not the best. I don't think he ever has been the best at coming out and claiming crosses. It's not been his thing. What he is doing now, actually, he's coming out and punching and getting distance on it. He, he seems to have changed his game. And at thirty seven ish, about to retire. Hats off to a guy who's willing to change his game at this late stage. But I think he's been really, really impressive, Paddy. You've seen him post-match yesterday with the celebrations, just soaking it all up. This is a guy who now has a max of nine games left in his career. What do you think? Yeah, um, I've been one of those people that said, 
he should have been replaced. And um, yeah, I, I still think he, that, that he should have. Um, for me, he's he, he has cost us some some saveable goals this this year. Um, that is not on the agenda. I'm, <laughs> listen, I'm coming round. Don't worry, I'll get there. I'll I'll I'll, I'll bring it back. Hold on, Joe. I can't keep, keep you. listening. I, I've got you, mate. Um, but I think uh, what, what you've what you've kind of got to see is that he has also had such a, an unsettled backline all season, and I think he's a confidence player, Joe Hart. He does come across very well. I think he talks a good game. I think he does have leader um, leadership qualities, one hundred percent. But ultimately, there needs to be trust between him and his backline, and I don't think he had that for the first six months of the season, to be honest. Uh, sorry, five months of the season. You then kind of come into January, and I actually think back to probably the 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 game before the winter break against against. Um, Rangers but before the St Mirren one um, he pulls off two or three incredible saves in that game but then goes and lets in the, the free kick from Tavernier now take nothing away it's a good free kick but I still think a goalkeeper gets across it personally what I've seen from this point on and, and from the break and from a bit of disillusion for Celtic fans uh, in terms of a transfer window and in terms of how things are how things are going is that the spirit between the players all seems to have seem to have got a bit stronger. Well, yeah, we had a couple of ropey performances, um, but it seems to be that he has focused on each and every single game, knowing that he has come to this end. He's announced his retirement for me at the right time, going into a run-in, and his performances have been absolutely brilliant. Some crucial saves from him. Um, he is a, he's a very, very good goalkeeper. I think he's had an incredible career, and I think he'll want to go out with two trophies. I really do, and it's a hundred percent commitment, a hundred percent concentration from at one point a world class goalkeeper, in my opinion. I think the timing of his announcement, Asim, was really um pivotal. It's an important message to send out and you need to be careful with it. And the story is that he contacted the club and kinda of coordinated it with him. I think he sat down with his own guy to do the interview, all that kind of stuff. It was, you know, carefully staged because that's the modern game. You you've got to be careful with how you put these things out. And in terms of how they might be received mid season, is he down in tools? What's the approach? And actually, if anything, he's he's stepped up since then. I think it's obviously been on his mind. He could have gone and got another club. He could, yeah. Somebody will give him a two year deal if he wants it. Go to the MLS, which was the chat. But he's decided, I want to go out here and I want to go out in a high and I want to get all the speculation out on the table and say, this is what I'm doing. And I think it's it's certainly galvanised him as an individual, but I also think it's galvanised his teammates. You've heard various guys now coming out and say, to the words to the effect of we want to do this for Joe yeah. Hart. He's our guy, and we want to make sure yes that we got his winners. But he is one of our main main characters in the dressing room. Yep. Also finishes yeah. on a high. You, you stopped short. You didn't say you, is he getting your vote? <laughs> no. <laughs> 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 to be honest, no one's had a consistent That's the thing season. I was though. going to say. I know. No one. Uh, was much. I found out. Just vote Joe. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> no bother. Um, we've, got, we've got two here anyway. <laughs> Maybe three. I, I, well, I was asked this question earlier and I was reluctant to give it as well for, for many of the reasons you said. But I, if you do look at it, I think he's one of the few players this season who you can say has consistent, been consistent. He's not really had a bad spell. I think obviously there was the, the fire road free kick off, off the top of my head, maybe the Rangers free kick and, and maybe a couple of other wee instances. But by and large, he's not had a poor spell. And I would say since the return of the break, um, Bucky Thistle game included, if you remember, he made a one-on-one -on -one save there. Yeah. Um, in pretty much every game since, he's made saves at crucial points. I think at Pitodre, especially Easter Road, if you remember. So he really has kind of shown his worth in the in the last uh, few months in terms of on the pitch. But I think the bigger thing with him is, like you say, his leadership skills, having that experience, having that guy that you, you feel galvanises the rest of the squad. As you mentioned, I think like it was Greg Taylor maybe on Instagram or something said, right, we're going to let's finish this well or something along those lines on his retirement post. He seems a very popular figure. Um, and yeah, on the park as well, he's he's making big saves now. So I, I definitely think you know if he carries this form on, and we've got two two derby games left, if he makes big saves in those, you, you could argue that he has been the the most consistent and most valuable player this season. Obviously, we've just had a bit of inconsistency with the rest of the players as well. So he's not a standout candidate, but his um, his worth has been brilliant. You know, he's he's one of those. Every time he speaks, he comes across really well. I think his personality, just from, from the day day one when he signed, there was maybe a lot of player, uh, fans who weren't on board with the signing. Um, but he's just won them all around with, with how he's came across. And yeah, I think he could be a, a crucial part in the, the remainder of this season, just if he can 
keep up his form um, and just like you say that leadership that know-how of winning titles he's done that he's mm-hmm. one of the few in that squad to have so um, yeah I, I, you know it could be a perfect send off a couple of titles and a, a player of the season vote from the fans would be would be lovely yeah I think title wise Paddy you can confirm us is he get two by Man City aye and two aye. here mm-hmm. it'd be nice to add a, a further mm-hmm. title absolutely and I think what you are seeing as I say each and every time he now pulls on the gloves, as I say, there's maybe nine games to go. There's a real laser focus. I think he's going out in every single game saying, I'm not going to do this many more times. I'm going to make it the absolute best it can be yeah. each and every time between now and the end of the season. And it is unique, isn't it? This is the 1st of April we're recording and you've got, well, you don't have to make these votes. Nobody's got a gun to your head, but you're, you're asked to make these votes when there's still potentially nine games of the season to go. And there's a lot that can happen in those those final games. But the question's being asked of Celtic, that's why we've asked it here. Paddy, I'll come to you first on my next question. If it is not Joe Hart, and I've given you the short slash long list, who is it? <laughs> tough one, uh, it? It is a tough one. I think um, he's been a bit off the boil lately, but I, I do think like Matt O'Reilly has been, has been so, so important for us this season. Um, not playing with the guys he usually plays alongside, a lot of change in the midfield as well. You look every position, there's been so much change this year. Um, so the consistency has been totally out the window for the full team. See, just on that, but I actually had scribbled down while you were chatting. I, I was fully listening to you. I was, I was very, I was very <laughs> <All> focused. <right. laughs> but Joe Hart, at different times, he's had that inconsistency. And the reason you reminded me is because you talk about it a lot as a goalkeeper having a, a steady and reliable back four is so important. But at different times, he said Tony Ralston at right back. Mm-hmm. Bernard be at left back mm-hmm. that's not easy to deal with no. for loads of reasons he said Navrocki Lager Bielka Welsh various different centre halves and only now and in, and in the last few weeks um, he's got that steady back yeah. four again it's Alistair Johnson it's Greg Taylor it's Cameron Carter-Vickers it's Liam Skills you can debate you know what's happened with Navrocki and different things but at the moment on paper that's Celtic's best back four and yeah. I think now that that's consistent and hopefully remains so will really help Joe Hart but you've, you've seen that I think even the, the confidence he takes from Carter Vickers coming back into the team is, is clear to see. There was a lot of games we were kind of talking about in the first uh, two or three months of the season where we were worried about Carmack's performance. But I think the likes of Hart, the likes of McGregor, even I'd say Greg Taylor, they were overcompensating for just unfamiliarity. And and I think that that has settled down. It, we our, our strongest form of attack comes from our back line. Uh, always the case with the way we play football. I think Ange was a master of it um, and I think Rodgers has actually just been dealt an unlucky hand in terms of the players available this year but it's calming down and actually I'm not a huge fan of Liam Scales I, 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 I've said that before um, I take my hat off to what he's done this season um, but if the back line is comfortable and Liam Scales is a part of that for the time being and Liam Scales is a part of it that's fine I just think uh we, we've really been up against um, how many times we've had to change our start 11 this season we really have so your vote goes to Matt O'Reilly Matt O'Reilly mm-hmm. what about yourself James if not Joe Hart who would be the top of the tree for you same um, even out of form Matt O'Reilly sets up two goals yesterday Aye. you know yeah. so I, I thought he was poor he was in and out he, was, he looks leggy most games there's things that don't come off for him there's stray passes unforced errors but he still contributes, you know. Um, we obviously want to get him back to, you know, his absolute best, and and that will come. Hopefully, it comes starting Sunday. But on the list you've shown, yeah, you know, Scales has done a remarkable job, and you have to say, where would it be the season without Liam Scales? I think mm-hmm. that's a question that's to be asked. So you know, he deserves all of our thanks for his contribution this season. I don't think he's he's at the level we need, and that's just football can be hard sometimes. But if we want to kind of progress in Europe. I don't think Scales is, is going to hit the high sink similar to Taylor. He's, he's maxing out his yeah. performances. So, yeah, with the rest of the guys on the list there, I think Matt O'Reilly's the, the choice. Yeah. Uh, what about yourself? Ask me, are you in agreement or have you got someone else in mind? No, I think if you asked this in December, it was a, it was a no-brainer. It was yeah. it was Matt O'Reilly and then Liam Scales would have been second in line. But the drop-off has been quite considerate from O'Reilly, but I still think he was that good for those first uh, yeah. half of the season. Um, and if he can pick up a bit of form just towards the end but I just think yeah he's he's been the kind of outstanding player for, for a large chunk of the season and then he's just kind of dropped off where the whole team's been pretty poor you know after the break for a while so um, if he can you know hopefully that goal yesterday might uh, lift him again but uh, and, and having the likes of Hitati to play with mm-hmm. you know should take off the burden off him to, to just get back to doing what he was doing better earlier in the season uh, so for me I still think it'll be uh, Matt O'Reilly well that's where my boat would go to yeah 
Paddy, I do not see Mikey Johnson on the list. I don't know if that's <laughs> an oversight. He must be young player of the year. It's West Brom's. He's the West Brom's player of the year. Last question just on this section, and it's a, a quick aside from the player of the year stuff, but one of the categories is goal of the season, as it always is. A um, couple of big goals there for Kyogo at Ibrox, then at Celtic Park against Rangers. Matt O'Reilly against Motherwell, James, you mentioned that for a feature from last week, but is there any standout goals for you lads uh, out with those ones? Out with those ones? Um... O'Reilly's at um, Pinecastle was was pretty sweet. The yeah, the ah, yeah, that was really a, good. That's a great goal. Um, I think Kyogo in the Celtic Park one for me just Hatati against Kilmarnock. It's a screamer as well. Just um, pulls the ball back and then touches it forward away yes. from the player. Great Very finish. Um, You've also got Kyogo against Atletico and Lazio. Two big goals at Celtic Park. Didn't one win, was, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's not the criteria. Everyone talks about Larson's goal in the three three against Rangers. Or, Still yeah. couldn't beat him. Yeah. <laughs> James, any other goals jumping out for you? No, I mean that's Matt, Matt O'Reilly's yesterday. Hey, oh, <laughs> just just, had, just had had a bit of zing on it, but I think Hatai <laughs> just beat some two of that one yesterday. Aye, um, aye, we had first. Uh, <laughs> nah, you've covered the, the big ones. I mean, it's O'Reilly uh, for part for me, just for the the sheer emotion aye. in that goal. Yeah, it's I've basically given you all the best goals just to make it really hard for you and said, oh, with those great goals and others. I, I, I did two goals though for Kyogo. What what is your favourite? Because I'm with you. I think the Celtic Park one's a, an incredible goal. He knows exactly where he's putting it, but the, the goal at Ibrox, oh, what yeah. a hit, man! What uh, a hit to uh, take it on the half volley. And it, it's the goal of the game. It's uh, the only goal of the game. Uh, so. You know, still the Celtic Park one for me. Because I, uh, I remember when he when he took the shot on, I was like, "What are you doing?" There's <laughs> options on. Aye, aye. As soon as it left his foot, you're like, "Wow!" He could have played my head down. Yeah. Uh, and it was and it was a game over goal as well. That yeah, was that. Know. It was done. Yeah. You know, you could ask me at different times. You asked me the day I'll say the Celtic Park one. I might make it the Ibrox one. Thing, <laughs> right? I think they were both. I think being there so as well. Do you think that's a factor, Paddy? Though, if it's a a match winning goal or an equaliser, is that? play its part rather than say a late consolation goal for example oh, aye, for what it means absolutely <laughs> it's like what James just said O'Reilly's goal at Fir Park great yeah. great moment um, we thought we'd kind of dropped points and then uh, just out of nowhere um, that goal at Ibrox we were still very early well not very early in the game but there was still plenty of football to be played so we were still uh, right on half time wasn't it yeah, yeah, aye, yeah. Aye. 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 it just it just silenced I, silenced I was getting it was on great. a flight just as that goal went in I was like didn't, didn't know the score until we landed. Oh, yeah. it was, it was a, even when watching it though, if you remember, it was like surreal because you're like, wait, is that just happened or is there an off? Like you, you expected because of the silence, the noise, just, like, uh, lack of noise. Great goal. Cool. Last week, I know I said I said that was the last question. This is the last question on that <laughs> section. We've talked about player of the years, goal of the season, all that kind of stuff. Is there anyone that maybe has fallen short this season? Maybe just underperformed anyone you were excited about? Maybe a new signing. Someone that we know well. You get a little bit of time. It's quite a lot. It's quite a lot for this one, isn't it? <laughs> dear, dear. You might make a new show of that next week. I, I, I would, for me, it's someone who's fallen off the radar very recently and it's Louis Palmer. Palmer. Mm. I get really excited about him when he came in at first. He got that big goal against mm. Atletico and I thought he was really going to step up. You were against it from the start. Not against him, no. I, I just, I don't really see... I see talent in him, no doubt. Yeah. I don't see him as a winger at all. You saw him against Ross County playing in a 10 role and he was outstanding. Came off the bench, I think, actually playing that 10 role. And he, he seemed really comfy in it. He got a goal. You know, he was really busy. On the wings, he just, mm. nah. He, he doesn't get anywhere near Celtic's wings now with Kuhn in his form. And, and we've not had time to cover what Kuhn done against Livingston. He was excellent mm -hmm. again. Yep. At man of the match, buddy, yep. I think. Three in yep. a row. Third in a row. And Yang, he's... Definitely bringing something to the party as well. So Louis Palmer's a bit of a disappointment for me, but anyone similar for you, Paddy? I, I think even with Palmer as well, though, I think, like, I'd still give the guy time. I'd give him, a, a like, a full one year at Celtic. Um, I do see him in the wings, actually. I just think he's a bit of a one-trip pony, but it, mm. takes, it takes a good yeah. manager to kind of like, bring that out of him and calm him down because we we'll look at the kind of deliveries we're now starting to see for Nicholas Kuhn. They're, they're on the point into the six-yard box. Palmer's not got that. Palmer takes an extra touch and thinks, hang on, there's a shot on here. He just needs to kind of cut some of that stuff out. That's why game. I can't see him on the wing, though, because of that one trick pony. Uh, I think, like, as I like, not comparing him at all to this this player I'm going to mention, but Moravchik style, because Moravchik was never quick, but he had aye. that kind of trickery and just that, that ping. The, you know, the, some of the goals that Palmer scored this season have been reminiscent of it's that. It's good technique. You know, good technique. Yeah, 100%. Um, I'd like to see him tried in there, just Maybe. You know, see if he can unlock a defence, but. 
I remember tweeting about him quite early, one of my infamous early <laughs> rash tweets. I'm going early. Um, you go too soon. I know. And I think I just said that. I think it was maybe the Feyenoord game, so it was literally his second appearance. And I just said, I don't know about him just because of his lack of lack of pace. Nice. Um, but then he went through a really good spell after that and then just tailed off again. But uh, he's someone that's not been in the picture. So, again, could play a, a, an important role in the last six games if, if we need him. Um, I'd like to see him on the right. I think on the left it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this cutting inside thing, everyone's worked out. Any right back in the league that doesn't know he's going to do that isn't yeah, doing their homework. Exactly. But on the on the right-hand side, you've mentioned that he has a good technician. He mm-hmm. can whip a ball in with a bit of pace, with a bit of something on it. And I'd like to see him on the right linking up with an Alistair Johnson, right. you know, overlap and underlap and whatever it might be, and trying to get some deliveries into Kyogo from there. Because as a footballer, he's clearly got ability. But at the moment, after a promise nearly start, he's not really kicked on. So we'll see. Listen, let's take a short break. When we come back, we'll be bringing you the latest mystery voice as Paddy and Assam take their first shot at our new feature. Welcome back, folks. We launched the mystery voice last week, which now replaces the mystery cell. And after a few guesses, Miff eventually got the answer, which was, of course... Carl Starfield. Carl Starfield. So signed from Ruben Kazan in July 2021, one of Angie's first signings. He formed a formidable partnership with Cameron Carter Vickers, as we all know. I think the stat applies that they never lost a league game together. Yeah, did, did that stay? Yep. An amazing record over the course of two seasons there. And unfortunately, love called James. Was, uh, wasn't the only formidable partnership. <laughs> <laughs> so he, uh, he moved on. He left uh, for Celta Vigo in the summer. And I believe he's a regular over there and good luck to him. Um, ask him your thoughts on, on Starfelt. Were you a fan? Yeah, I was. Um, he He's one of those that came in and got criticism early doors and for some it just stuck it was one of those that they did you tweet early about him <laughs> no I think I gave him a bit of time <laughs> um, but yeah and even within the media I think some of them just had it in from Michael Stewart I remember particularly was was pretty scathing of him but he for me as of like maybe a few months in was was pretty consistent and I think you've seen this season maybe he was under uh, undervalued well I, I'd, I've always thought he was very good but you see the the steady partnership he had with Carter Vickers and just how I think they complemented each other really well and we've just not managed to replace him. We were talking there about players that have disappointed. I would add Nabrowski to that list because I almost thought he would be mm. that replacement. So, yeah, difficult guy to replace. You, you've seen that. Just on that, Paddy, if he was still around, would he be starting games for Celtic oh, today? Without a doubt. Easy. Without a doubt. Yeah. Um, I think he's been a huge loss for us this season. Yeah. I really do. Yeah, I think so. Um, anyway, let's take a listen at this week's Mystery Voice. Game is this if it's, well, no, no matter what championship is this if it's a cup game or a league game uh, I want to score uh, to score in every single game. Uh, James, that may be correct. Oh, straight <laughs> in, straight in. I thought it might have been a bit easy. Right. It might have been a bit easy, but yeah, yeah, you're right in there with that no, one. No credit, just it was too no, easy. No credit, not you. I made it too easy. <laughs> it's all my fault. God, just George. Well, uh, we'll beep that out for anyone playing at home, and we'll cover a bit more detail on him in next week's show. We'll also reshare the clip on the socials for anyone who wants to have a go there. To close out the show, um, as mentioned, we'll be back on Friday with an extended kind of the kickoff ahead of Sunday's big game, where we will be asking various big questions. And we did cover this one to an extent at the start, but I do want to get your definitive opinions on one big question for now. Callum McGregor should be fit and available uh, after missing the last four games, including the international break. Put simply, and I've got your response already, James, but I'll come to you then, Paddy. Does he slot right back in in place of Tomoki Awata? Yes. Yep, definitely for me. Yep. Uh, no, I, I think he does not on any slight to Awata, apart from the fact that he's not played this tie or run the sixes in this tie um, Iwata yeah mm-hmm. so I think that's the big thing you're going to get from Hatati McGregor and O'Reilly's experience there's no fans you'll be getting hammered from minute one there'll be physicality all over the place I really rate Iwata and I think he's going to be a huge player for Celtic it might just be too soon for him I think Iwata's crucial to this game on Sunday in terms of if it's a, on, a game that we on. need to yep. control he comes yep. on uh, yep. Paddy you expressed a concern about potentially starting with McGregor and Hattati because you might have to take them both off at one point mm-hmm. would that still be a concern for you? It is but then I kind of look at the guys that are are, are coming in yeah. and, and I do have I, I'd rather we play our strongest two midfielders for the very get go get as, as long as we can out them the worry is is that they break down with injury again um, but I don't see that I don't think that's going to happen with Hattati on the basis that I generally think they've They've really looked after him coming back and I think they've actually kind of given McGregor the same amount of time just to, to be 100% crystal, knowing that we could easily go and take the momentum here on mm, Sunday. Yeah. So 
I mean, Celtic can certainly have rushed Callum McGregor for the weekend there. Aye. Livingston, it was it was an option to them. They've made a decision as a as a team, as a sports science team, as a backroom unit, not to take that gamble and keep them fresh for Ibrox. You guys made the point, though. I think like. Uh, have they maybe hit their momentum, they hit their, their, their peak a little bit too early and I think Celtic have possibly just looked at what have we got coming back here? Are these guys ready? Could this help us in the running? Yeah, I thought the I thought the refs had peaked too soon as well, but <laughs> <laughs> seen nothing yet. <laughs> what Paddy was referencing there was Miff, who said that Rangers peaked too early in the campaign and he thinks the momentum is now with Celtic. That gets some fun responses online, as you can imagine. <laughs> but uh, it was Miff that said it, no me, so we'll, we'll blame him for that. Um, ask some. I've asked the question there, I suppose, about McGregor replacing Iwata, but to James's suggestion, do you see him potentially coming in further up? Or? For O'Reilly? Yeah. Um, no, I think if he comes in, it will be for Iwata. I, I'm in the minority here, I might get a bit of stick, but with Iwata, I'm, I don't know. I, I think for this kind of game, I, I thought last season when he came on against Rangers, mm -hmm. he does well for the last 30 minutes, showing things up. I think he started the game at Ibrox that we lost, but yeah. again, there was a lot of changes in that game, so mitigating circumstances. Um, for me, he's sometimes too safe in possession, I felt, in the home games maybe. I think for a game at Ibrox, potentially that's what you need, someone that will just keep the ball moving. I think in games where I've, I've maybe been a bit frustrated is when I feel like he's too sidewards and, and safe in his, in his passing. A bit like Neil Lennon used to be, reminds me of that kind of player. But I think he serves a purpose. I thought yesterday with his interceptions and his off-the-ball work, especially second half, he can be really effective. And I think, like you say, an occasion like Ibrox, I think the good thing is you've got Bernardo who came on and obviously he'll get confidence from his goal and he's been trusted in this game as well. So I think if he did start Hitati, O'Reilly and McGregor, McGregor, which would be back three, who I think are the three best midfielders at the club, but you've got the option yeah. if they need to come off of two guys who are on form, who are feeling good about themselves, who've played... And I think that's a strong five to pick from. Mm -hmm. But if I'm going to start the three, it would be the three that have been there, done that, know the fixture, and have, have proved to be successful in this fixture. Generally speaking, I, I would agree with that. I think you do start your, your best players forever, and they are the three best midfielders at Celtic at this moment in time. And Callum McGregor's your captain. You yeah. know, he's your leader. He's been there, done that so many times. And I do think, as well as Cameron Carter Vickers and Joe Hart, in terms of what they bring leadership wise, the players look towards them. Mm -hmm. Asim, you mentioned that. Hatati being in the park at Livingston just in itself yeah. gave the players around him a boost and I think the same applies for Callum McGregor that said I wouldn't be too disappointed if Iwata starts if it's deemed that Callum McGregor's not quite there you know there was photos from training last week at Celtic Park and he seemed to be missing yet again he's not been in the park mm. with the players now he could he could have been there today or, or tomorrow or whenever it is and have a really good strong week of training I think fitness wise he's ready to go but it's a hell of a game James just to step back into isn't it not for Callum McGregor, it's not. No. no you know, Paddy mentioned earlier on, 2nd of February, or February 22, that tells you everything. And, you know, not being on the... He's two years older now. Nah, not <laughs> two years more experienced. Oh, not I being like on it. the training I park like doesn't necessarily mean anything negative. He could be following a very specific programme, and I'm pretty sure that he is. That necessitates, you know, maybe gym work, it might be, you know, swimming or whatever kind of thing that's, that's not on the park. Anytime he's on the park, it'll be mandated as part of his programme and when he's not, it's also the same. So no, no real concerns for me there. If he is past fit, he starts and he plays. As I said, I don't think this is a point. I, I know I'm speaking about is taking our time with players coming back, but I, I think it's if you're 60, 70, 80% fit, you're in the team now. And and just because of how important this running is for us. The thing with Awata is, do, do you feel comfortable or, and this is a question to all of you do you feel comfortable or confident with him trying to dictate the pace no. of our game on Sunday I, I don't, don't I don't and that's the thing I was going to say if you remember the Ibrox game earlier in the season McGregor ran the show mm. like they could not get near him I don't think they're going to allow that again I think yeah. they're going to go man to man on him but see if you've got Rio there mm. that's that, another worry yeah because they, yeah. whereas if you've got Iwata they could probably be just like right we'll focus on Rio because they wouldn't mind the Wata having the ball because he's not going to really hurt, whereas McGregor can hurt you, Rio can hurt you, Matt O'Reilly can hurt you. I think we start the three and yeah. we can go for it. Yeah. You're convincing me. I'm, I'm <laughs> hearing it. What you did see from Wata, and I was just going to ask your, your general opinions on him as a player, Paddy, but as I mentioned, he is a, a safe player. He is very much like Neil Lennon, just side, side, back. Lennon got booed for that at times at Celtic, <sighs> which was nuts because he'd done such a good job and he was so effective. I thought Wata had a... I'm a big fan, it's on record, mm -hmm. you, you mm -hmm. are as well. Yeah. And... He had a, a poor game, possibly his poorest game against Hearts. Yeah. Obviously there was a sending off and things going on, but he got his pocket picked a couple of times and it just wasn't a great day for him. I had a couple of folk then tweeting me back, oh, where's your Awata now? You know, and <laughs> fine, right, that's part of it. But 
I think he's a very good player, but he is a safe player. Yep. And it just depends what Brendan Rodgers is going to Ibrooks for. Is he going all out to win? And if he is, I think you're right. It's McGregor, Hattati O'Reilly. Is he going there to soak it up for the first half and see what they bring to the party? If so, it might be an Awata. But do you know what? But then I would say to you on that. Either way. Is yeah. if, if they're coming up against us and we're the ones trying to soak all the pressure, he didn't do that at Tyne Castle. Yeah. And that's my worry about him. I think he needs to be on the, the offence more than anything. Um, I think he's very comfortable coming in and taking control of midfield when guys have ran about for an yes. hour mm. as well. I really do. His best games against Rangers was those cup games when I, he came on. I, Hamden, yep. I, I, I definitely see a player that can, can get better. He's just not had enough exposure to a, like that yeah. kind of yeah. environment, in my opinion. But and there's only one way to give him that exposure. Ah, it's too no, it's too not at this point of the season. One, Come on, yeah. you. <laughs> once, <laughs> once you've got a bit more in your in your backpack, kind of thing. I, the one, you know, all the Rodgers will be looking for, start to finish on Sunday, is control. You know, it's not he's not going to play for a draw. He's not going to play for a win. He's going to look to control the game, and win the game for there. So play for a win. Play for a win, yeah. 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 Um, we'll cover all yeah. as I say we'll be back uh, myself, James and Paddy at 12 noon on Friday we'll cover all in much more detail ask them, we might not speak to you before Sunday so just to get your own scoreline prediction what are you going with I know it's early in the week but I used to go early I so, so he does um, you can tweet it tonight if you I, like <laughs> I think it genuinely is a title defining game like I know there's a lot of football still to be played after it um, not to be negative but I just think if we lose this and we go potentially five behind going into the split what you're saying is the rest won't let it happen I hear you well there's that as well <laughs> but well, um, I think we can't afford to lose so I, I'll take a take a draw even if you ask me at this stage and I think that's what the score will be I think it will be a score draw score draw ok we'll see how it plays out and we'll get the, the boys opinion later in the week just a small thing um, I'd like to touch on but we're maybe going to catch it earlier on just the way the discussion was going but it's about it's about Sky Sports and how they're presenting Scottish football but let's be more pointed about it. It's about Chris Boyd and the nonsense he's bringing. I get they need to, or do they need to? In Scottish football, there needs to be a Rangers guy and a Celtic guy and it's Sutton v Boyd and all that stuff. And that's what they've gone with for, for some time now. But I get that if it's a Rangers-minded guy who's got a decent opinion and, and so, something worth listening to. And that's that's valid, right? You know, we are Celtic, they're Rangers, that's fine. But give us something credible. You've got the penalty situation that we've, we've already discussed in a bit of detail there about Kyogo and the, the contact that was made and different things. You've got Chris Boyd with the eyes painted on because he can't be seeing that and saying what he's saying. It doesn't it doesn't match up, Paddy. He's basically just saying, I'm doing the Rangers thing here. I'll just say, no, it isn't he? And here's yeah. why it isn't. It's becoming farcical. He, he doesn't even say why it isn't. Yeah. I didn't even give that. It's it's pretty pathetic stuff. It's extremely petty from him. Um and you know, where people are spending so much money a month on this on this coverage. Um we're talking about it, but mm -hmm. we're talking about it for all the wrong reasons, and that's that. That's all these uh, TV companies want is people to be speaking about what's happened on the show. Mm. I want to pay money, and I want to listen to people speaking about football and understanding how football operates. And that guy's not got a clue. S somebody tweeted today. I'm not sure who it was that said Chris Boyd's doing his job because look at us. We're tweeting about uh -huh. him right now, and I get that. But to your point, Paddy. You do want to be entertained, James. You want some detail. I don't care if he's a Celtic, Rangers, Hearts, Hibs, whatever. If someone's giving you good insight, that's enjoyable. If someone's maybe played the game or been at a level or been around football and can say, actually, here's what's happened here and give you something to think about. But as I say, Chris Boy's just playing the panto villain type stuff yeah. and it's it's become so tired and so boring. It's pathetic. You know, and, and Sky need to take a good look at themselves here because we're trying to you know, build our game and promote our game. They are tasked with doing that as part of the, the media outlet. And they're putting on a guy that you could have dragged them out of any Rangers pub in Glasgow and get the exact same opinion. There's no nuance, there's no intelligence behind it. If you listen to uh, Go Radio and you listen to Barry Ferguson, you know, Rangers legend, all that stuff, very, I, I really like listening to, uh, listening to Barry Ferguson talking about football because he knows what he's talking about. He's played mm -hmm. football all his life and he considers what he's about to say. Yeah. If he was sitting in that seat uh, where Boyd was yesterday, he'd have been saying, that's a penalty for me, he's kicked through the back of him. No doubt in my yeah. mind. So it's not about you know, a Rangers thing, that it's just about the idiocy of the guy. That's the simplest thing. If you want a good laugh, um, YouTube, Chris Boyd, Mattress Advert. That's no. all I'll say. Amazing. Is that when he was in the States? No? Ah, it's incredible. He struggles to say the word mattresses. It's <laughs> one of the funniest things I've ever watched in my life. It's just the thing, like, as James says, I quite like Barry uh, Ferguson's commentary as well and people can clip this up as they, as they <sighs> yeah. tend to do and that would go down well. But it's just someone who's, he, he's not just sticking on a blue jersey and yeah. saying well I'll just say this for the yeah. sake of it and 
the, the, is to be encouraged. See, as I say, no matter who, who someone supports as a pundit, yeah. if it's just detailed analysis and insight, that's what we're all in yeah. it for, isn't it? Yeah, just to give another couple of examples who might not be everyone's cup of tea, but I think, like James has said, can add something else. Well, like Neil McCann, another one who I think, no. you know, no, no, no. no. <laughs> but I just feel, absolutely not. But I feel like it's not just about wind up for Neil McCann. Like, I might not agree with all of his opinions, yeah. but, you know, and similarly, McCoyst, again, like, I'm not a, his big. Uh, <laughs> Actually, you're killing me here, man. <laughs> but what, I've had to stop watching Midweek Football because of him. <laughs> McCoy's, that oh, I, I'm not yeah, McCoy's, insufferable. I quite like him. No, oh, no, no, no. Guys, cut this last piece. <laughs> <laughs> I just, <laughs> just stop <laughs> that in 50. But with Boyd, he offered, well, Sky clearly rate him because they've got him on the Gillette's, you know, the pundit yeah. uh, panel for that as but, well. But he's there as an idiot for that show Aye. and he gets made an idiot of and yeah. had done for the last three or four years. It's, it, like you say, anyone tuning in for actual football analysis or anything articulate, it's just pointless. Like we mentioned Sutton before, he can bring a bit of both. He can mm-hmm. be a wind-up, mm-hmm. but he's humorous with it and he's intelligent, he's played at a high level. Boyd just brings nothing to the table whatsoever. And then I think some of the co-pundits sometimes seem to be getting annoyed with him as well by the looks of it. Aye. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was, you know, we talked about before we came on here, it's worth kind of just repeating that when it cut to the Liverpool-Brighton game, um, which is poor from Sky's point of yeah. view, don't put us in your main sports channel if you're going to put us in the, the second channel after. So it cut from main event to Sky Sports Football and they say they're doing that half-time. That's fine for us as fans to say, what are you doing? Boy starts moaning about that and you're going, they're paying your wages. You know what I mean? No. I do. So, Chris Boyd, Neil McCann, Barry Ferguson, <laughs> Alan McCoyst, all big favourites, are we agreed? <laughs> just, just, just basher for me. Yeah, well, let, let's move on uh, before we get ourselves in even more bother. Paddy, I'll come to you for your final comments for the week. Watch that YouTube video, it's really funny. <laughs> <laughs> Please. That's a, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll retweet it, surely. <laughs> um, I'm excited. I am. I, this is what it's all about for me. It's um, what it's getting to a, a right exciting point of the season, and and just feel that things are starting to kind of move in the right direction for us at the right time. Um, as I say, um, I do think we can we could play a bit better, a bit quicker, um, and I think that's going to come. The guys will get used to playing each other again, especially that midfield three. I think it's going to be super important for us for the the running in this season. You've seen Greg Taylor getting back into just a little bit of familiarity of what he was doing last season. Mm. Alistair Johnson, since we've come back as well, I think he's just getting there too. And and as you mentioned earlier on, Nicholas Coon is looking the player. So it's uh, it's exciting times. Yeah, lots to be excited about. Asim, your own final comments. Yeah, I think the nerves will start kicking in just because it's such a massive game. But we, we're going into it in as good form and place we, as we can be. Obviously, we'll just wait and see what happens with McGregor. But... If he's fit, then you're looking at only Palma being the one that's really injured at the moment. So it's in terms of squad, it's as strong as we've been all season. Um, eagerly awaiting to see who the, the refs are. I bet you Beaton will be involved somehow. <laughs> um, Be- Beaton and Walsh. Aye, Is that not so. due about now? We're recording at tea time here on Monday. I think Is it's that, due about now. Be Walsh ref Beaton. Um, you just wouldn't be surprised that they'll, no? they'll, they'll, they'll stick Beaton in there somewhere. Um, Bring back Mike McCurry just for the buzz. Maybe <laughs> maybe call him over. Because he can't trust his safety in the stadium, but Walsh will be there, I think. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. But um, looking forward to it, and like I say, as long as we can avoid defeat, I think we're in a very, very strong position. Yeah. yeah. And as always, we we'll look forward to your tweets, Asim. So <laughs> <laughs> keep an eye. Uh, James... Three minutes past twelve. <laughs> <laughs> Get <that> off. <laughs> James, last word goes to yourself. Eh, hey, just here, here we are now. You know, so seven games to go, and from yesterday's performance, I thought first half maybe just a wee bit over eager, some you know clumsy stuff. Second half was professional beyond belief. And I'll take seven more of them. I think we need to win six of these seven to be to be absolutely sure. So here we go. Yeah, as Brendan says, and we'll keep repeating it, this is a fun time, but no more fun than winning at Ibrook. Yep. So let's hope that's where we get to this weekend. So that wraps things up on this latest episode of the Celtic Exchange Weekly. Thanks to James Assam and Paddy for joining me and thanks to you for tuning in. Don't forget to join us live on Friday afternoon at 12 o'clock for the countdown to kick-off. But in the meantime, as always, thanks for supporting the Celtic Exchange and we'll see you again very soon.